Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, I'd like to demonstrate to you examples where the king becomes the hero. Not just avoiding trouble, but actually act actively participating in attack. Here we go. In our first position, it is Black's turn. If you look at the material balance, white is a pawn ahead. Moreover, white has two connected passed pawns on g6 and h5 that look rather dangerous. One's first idea would be to try to give some checks. For example, coming rook b3, king f4, and then rook f2. Almost checkmate. But as we know, almost doesn't quite count. And in fact, white would be in a winning position after blocking the check and then marching up with the two connected passed pawns. How about doubling up the rooks on the second rank and threatening with checkmate on f2? Well, that's a threat, but white can defend successfully against it by simply advancing the king. And then again, if rook f2 check, the rook can just block like in the previous variation. Also, checking with the pawn wouldn't do anything because after that pawn move, no one protects the pawn on f5, which the king would simply capture. Okay, that sounds good. So the big question is, how can black still win this endgame? Why this seems to be ahead, those two pawns seem to be unstoppable, and yet white has a brilliant winning move. And that move is, hopefully you pose and try to figure it out on your own, the winning move is king e5, taking away the f4 escape square from the white king, and unfortunately for white, the way the rooks are positioned kind of uh, are in the king's way. And there's not much that white can do to prevent the black rook from coming to b3 to checkmate. A very nice example. Now we're going to follow up with two very similar positions to each other. However, as you'll see, there will be major differences. Let's go. Here we go in the next position. In this simple looking endgame, White can win if it's White's turn. If it would be Black's turn, the Black Queen would get out of the corner and in fact capture White's pawn right away and would be doing just fine. However, with White to move, White has a quiet, simple, but very effective move to win the game. And that is moving the king to h3 making sure the black king does not escape from the corner. At the same time, white also is threatening to check the king either from e4 or f3, which would end the game pretty quick. Let's move on to the next example. This is a tricky one. Looks rather similar. Can you notice the difference? Yes, the difference is that we moved the black pawn from b7 to c6. No more pawn on b7, but one on c6. But how does this make a difference? Well, the major difference is that if king h3, do you see what it is? Well, the difference is that now black can escape. But how? Miraculously, black here can force stalemate. That's one of the things you need to be very careful of in endgames where the king is in the corner. In this case, the correct move is queen e3, checking the white king and attacking the queen. White has no better choice than capturing it, and that's stalemate. Interestingly, in one of the books where I saw this endgame, they suggested that black should play queen f2 with the same idea. Although then, white could still be winning. 
Nevertheless, white has a way to win, but not with king h3. In this case, white can force a win by playing queen f3, check. If king h2, the game ends immediately with an elegant checkmate. Or, after queen g2, white gets there first. After the exchange of the queens, the king can just march and keep marching. And then, after king e5, white gets to black spawn first before black would ever do that. And now, of course, next move, the king just moves out of the pawn's way, and then the pawn marches up. You may wonder, going back to the previous position, but what's the difference? Why couldn't white do the same thing here as well? First of all, king h3 would be just easier and simpler here, because there is no longer a stalemate danger. As long as a pawn can move even, we are not even talking about stalemate at all. Here, on the other hand, the same tactic by trying to exchange the queens and then run to the other side would be too slow because black spawn is just one file further. As you can see, now the black king arrives just on time and the game will end in a draw. Okay, let's move on to some middle game positions now. Here we go. This is from a real game between the former Soviet grandmasters Cheskovsky and Albert. In this position, it is White's turn. Black has just moved the queen to e8 in the hopes to exchange queens. That would certainly be a big relief for black, considering the sensitive position of their king on h6. Of course, white would not want to do that. White's goal here has to be to chase the king out further to the wild. And that's exactly what white did. White captured on g5, which is a double check, because it also has opened up the h file, giving black only one choice, recapturing on g5. Now white has to be careful, because, for example, if white would play queen e6, which looks like a good move, threatening checkmate and so on, black would have the opportunity to force the exchange of the queens by moving the bishop back to f8 and because the white queen is pinned black would be certainly still in the game. So here the correct move is to sacrifice our rook. Well it's not a very deep sacrifice because if knight takes the game ends immediately with queen f5. After rook d5, king moved to f4. And now comes the hero into the game. The king. Can you believe it? The queen is hanging on f7, the rook is hanging on d5, and white can afford to make a king move. In fact, white should make a king move. Amazingly, white can play simply king f2, protecting the f3 pawn as well as the escape squares e3, g3 from the black king. And now, if queen takes queen, then simply checkmate arrives. Or, if black does not capture the queen, but plays queen d7, then white would bring the other rook to the game as well with rook e1 threatening with a simple checkmate of rook e4 because the knight is pinned on f6. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. 
This is from a game of Rosalimo back in Paris in 1944. It's White's turn, and it seems at first that White's king is in a bad position, out on the open on f3. The black pawn on f5 is attacking our knight on e4. Things seem to be pretty solid for black, and in fact, black is a couple of pawns up. So unless white can come up with something brilliant right away, black will win. For example, if white makes a natural move, like moving the knight away from the attack, black could win additional pawns by knight e5. Or even check with the queen on d5. Looks really sad for white. Here, there is a brilliant combination that opens up the position against the black king. Queen takes pawn. Well, the first pattern to notice that if pawn takes, then knight f6 check, king goes back, and not capturing the queen, but rook g8 checkmate. Another very famous pattern. So let's go back. And look again, obviously before you would ever sacrifice your queen, you'd need to see things through. What if king takes? Well, the good news is white has a check forcing the king to g6. But what now? If white would keep giving checks, black could even escape the perpetual checks by going back to h7 and then hiding back on g8. So what may white do in this position? It looks like quite a hopeless situation. Why did we give our queen up? And this is again where amazingly white involves the king in the attack. And that brilliant move is moving the king to f4. That's really amazing. Now, if black, for example, captures the knight, then white will follow up with a check and on the next move, bishop takes pawn, basically checkmating. Black can only delay the very end by blocking the check, and then rook takes queen and checkmate. Let's go back a couple of more moves to king f4. But here, black has a whole bunch of options. He can move any of their pieces, other than the king, of course, to try to prevent this threat of bishop h5 and then bishop f7 discovery. There is a very good looking move, rook e6. Now the idea is that if white follows the same way, then black is winning because the rook blocks the check and the attack is over. And yet, amazingly, even though white is a whole queen down, can afford two quiet moves in a row. Try to think and figure out what is the winning move here. It's a very simple, very quiet move, but truly amazing. It's rook h8. A very brilliant move. A quiet move with a major threat. That is, to checkmate with the bishop on h5. Black is pretty much helpless against it. Pretty much against any move, white's final move is bishop h5, checkmate. A real jewel. Let's move on and see the next example. Here we go. In this position, white has an active pair of bishops, but black is up a pawn. The good news is black is also undeveloped a bit. Black's rook is still sleeping in the corner and the bishop in its initial square on c8. However, if black would get to let his bishop out, the game likely to end in a draw. This is a perfect example how, despite the little material left on the board, 
we can practically say we're in an endgame, white can still create an attack. And most impressively, by using his most peaceful piece, the king. In this game, white proceeded by playing king g5. The threat is well demonstrated what happens after f4. King moves in to f6, and if black just proceeds with developing, white is ready to checkmate black by these two bishop moves. Black figured out that that is white's plan and played differently. If now black moves the knight back to d8, trying to get to e6, white would still follow up with king f6. And if black tries to rescue the rook from the side by playing a5 with the idea of then rook a6 check, then white has a pretty combination, again forcing checkmate in two. Namely, bishop f7 check, and then, after knight takes bishop, rook e8, back rank checkmate. Very nice. Again, let's go back. After king g5, knight d8, and other option is king f6. And now to try to give up the bishop and knight for a rook. The problem is, after rook takes bishop and knight takes, white can do better then king takes knight, in which case the black rook would capture the white bishop. White will play bishop f7 check, king h8, and then bishop takes knight. Now again, the black king is stuck in the corner with an unavoidable checkmate of bishop g7. And finally, let's see what happened in the actual game. After king g5, black chose to activate his knight in the middle of the board with knight e4. However, the response was identical, king f6, and black is pretty helpless against white, bishop f7, and then bishop g7 plan. Just like we saw after knight d8, again, after bishop e6, the response is rook takes bishop, and here black resigned in the game, because after knight takes bishop f7, and white wins again. Let's move on, see the next example. Here we go. Whoa, what a position. What is the white king doing on g5? Well, of course, the white king is attacking. Don't worry, in this position, it is not white's turn. In that case, the game would end real quick. It is black's turn, and black is almost giving checkmate to white. However, as I keep mentioning, almost doesn't quite count. Black played h6 check. Looks like black's attack is devastating. The only thing that works for white is that white has a discovery in the air. If that white rook from f7 will get to move, it will not only move, but will also give a discovered check. Now, white has to be very careful. If the king would go to h5, that would allow black to checkmate in just two moves by creating a double check from the knight as well as the queen, forcing the king to move out, and now black can choose from various checkmates, for example, queen h5. Okay, let's go back. After h6, let's see how white can do better. The king can and should go to g6, not to h5. Now, if black would try to check with the queen, white would be ready to give a discover check with the bishop from a2, and it's white who is winning. Black played, knight e5 check. Looks like a good looking move. Sacrificing the knight, but opening the g-file. 
queen takes and rook g1. Now this is the tricky moment of the game. If white would indeed move out of the check, black would save the game by playing queen f2 and now the king cannot successfully move to e6 because then queen would take the rook. On the other hand, after king e4, black can force a draw by repetition of moves with queen c2 and then rook e1, king f3 and now not capturing the queen which would allow then a discovery of rook c7 and winning the queen back but simply rook f1 and keep attacking the king. White would have no escape, the game would end in a draw. Let's go back to the key moment where White found in the actual game between Shashin and Korchnoi the winning move. And the winning move is the brilliant Queen G5. Now, if Black captures the Queen with the pawn, White would be ready to checkmate first with a discovered check and then back rank checkmate on F8. After queen g5, the game ended with black capturing the bishop and then white giving a double check, followed by an elegant checkmate with rook g8. Again, going back for one more variation. In this position, after queen g5, if rook takes the queen with a check, then white calmly recaptures and black's problem is that they cannot get out of the discovery. And finally, let's see the jewel of the week. Here we go. Whoa, what is this with so many horses on the board? Well, this is for fun. That's why it's called the jewel of the week. A bit more seriously, white actually has only one way to win the game, but that's enough. Well, if you feel like, try to figure it out. If you don't want to break your head, then just look at, listen to the solution, which I'll share with you in just a moment. The important thing here to recognize is that if any of the black knights move at this moment, White would have a checkmate to give. However, if White moves any of the knights, then that no longer will be the case. Therefore, White should move the king. The winning move is King A2. I'm not going to show all the knight moves one by one. There are many of them in this position. Just to demonstrate a couple, for example, if the knight from c6 moves away, then the knight comes a6 to b4. Beautiful checkmate. Or, if for example the knight from e4 moves away, then white is ready to checkmate by moving the d1 knight to c3. And if you feel like, check it out one by one for all the different knight moves. How can white checkmate with one of his knights? This is a composition by Williams in 1903, a long, long time ago. A lot of fun, of course, not likely to happen often in practical games. Well, I hope you learned a bit about the power of the king. I agree it's not the common thing that happens. However, once in a while, and especially in end games, it's not so rare that the king becomes an active participant or even an attacking piece. However, this is the exception from the rule. Generally, make sure you hide your king real well and don't make it walk around in the middle of the board, especially until there are many pieces on the board left. So, these are no exceptions. Just use it when you're pretty confident that it will work. Unless we're talking about endgames, when generally the king can be an active participant. Thank you for listening and so long until next week. Mm -hmm.